my friend Dave and I to spend a lot of time talking about uh, technology and gaming and that sort of thing. So we thought, well, why not just share this with other people? The both of us sit there listening to this kind of thing in the background. Why not let other people do the same thing? Um, we cover a lot of subjects in this first uh, attempted episode from... Um, playing the Xbox 360 on a CRT monitor to uh, old technology that was hidden inside London's BT Tower, uh, a Voxel-based uh, sandbox game called Teardown. Uh, we also talk a little bit about the broken promise of open-world games and uh, filler content in open-world games, uh, why we both own a Vectrex, which was the last uh, consumer vector graphics console, and we talk about the uh, NVIDIA uh, RTX 3080 GPUs and all the saga around not being able to get one anywhere for love no money except that somehow dave got one uh, and also a little bit about amd versus intel because you can't really avoid that can you anyway i hope you enjoy it uh see you on the inside the thing is like pulsing at like 50 hertz or something if you have <laughs> a photosensitive it's epilepsy it's <laughs> Please do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna find out. At least I've got someone watching me. If I if I seize out, yeah, but I'll I'll just I'll just I'll just laugh at you until I. I or you know, you were like, like what was his name who died on uh, stage? One of the famous comedians, Tommy Cooper, wasn't it? Where he like stepped back and had a heart attack, and people thought he was having a joke. <laughs> they were all laughing at him. Laughing. Yeah, that's yeah. actually if you watch that clip on YouTube, like no, since it, yeah, it's it's on YouTube. You can just watch him die, and everyone just starts laughing, and then the. And the curtain comes down. It's like holy fuck! <laughs> like, just roll the credits. Like the end. It's a cool note to start on. So this is our first experimental <laughs> plot attempt at a sort of uh, vo- what do you call these nowadays? Vodcast. I think it's a vodcast, isn't it? Because it's like a video podcast. It's a horrible word, though. Yeah, um, I think I think you call it low effort YouTube videos. Low effort <laughs> YouTube videos. That's fair. <clears throat> Because what and we're, because we're both always sending each other voice messages about tech and encouraging each other, each other to spend far too much money on technology, and so therefore there must be an audience for this kind of stupidity, right? <laughs> oh, do, you have, do you have dogs now? Uh, I have a dog, but this is some neighbour's dogs going crazy over a firework display that's happening outside. Oh, I thought someone was shooting dogs. That was my first. Oh, <laughs> just shooting. Just out like executing dogs. Like, uh, the RTX voice thing. I thought maybe that would be blocking that out. It doesn't block out the screams of innocent animals. Animals now. <laughs> <so. laughs> Are there any settings to this RTX voice or anything? Is it just just does its thing? No, it's like that's the whole of the future, isn't it? The AI just tells you what's going to happen, and you you accept it and cry. There's no, there's no. So you've just got a slider on RTX voice, more noise reduction or less. I've noticed it does glitch out sometimes. Like I've um, I did a, another podcast type thing for EOSHD.com, like a camera um thingamajigger, and my side is RTX voice. Then occasionally it would just go <laughs> and just make these weird glitches. It's really odd. This is um, a, a beat. Uh, yeah, what was I going to say? Oh, gaming. Yeah, I suppose we might as well talk about gaming because um, that's something we both both do, and I I do some work in that field now. And you you are always have some project for some kind of retro gaming type enterprise that you're currently working on. So the last thing I was doing before, because there was a kind of a lull between generations, right? Where everyone's waiting for the PS5, the Xbox Series X, the 38. Everyone's waiting for the 38. Um, I, I kind of got a bit reminiscent and thought, well, maybe the 360 is now a, now a retro console, right? And you Guess never it see it at the time. You kind of think, oh, that will always look kind of modern, but now it kind of looks like absolute dog shit when you go back. Um, <laughs> so to, to get around the dog shit factor, I decided that I would um, see if I could run it through my, I had a, a Sony PVM monitor, a CRT. Um, which accept only the yeah, maximum 480i. Mm. Um, but lo and behold, obviously, the, the 360 was in the, the crossover generation between HD. So whilst it's kind of touted as a HD console, mm. it's actually 480i built for 480i. You know, it's, it's, it's not just like a thing it can do. Everything scales properly to 480i. The games mm. have to support 480i. Um, you know, it's four by three ratios are even common in most of the games. So I plugged that in, and actually, they turned a... Uh, what would look terrible on a 4K TV into like the ultimate CRT experience. You've got this pin (laughs) sharp 
PVM professional monitor combined with the highest possible details that you can shove into it as a, mm-hmm. as a component and everything. And, I, and actually, I was really enjoying it. I, I, I had a little bit of a renaissance of 360. Yeah. It's one of those odd things, isn't it, about CRT? Because it's, it's sort of the same. I, I have... Th- Th- uh, three Sony PVMs of a sort, but they're not up to the same standard of yours. I, I use them for that current retro trend of you put footage or graphics onto it, you film it with your digital camera off of that, and then put that back into your edit, and it gives things that vibe. Like I, I did some of the development work for the Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War teaser. Um, oh, really? with a company called Spov in London and that that was involved in the same thing like I was doing loads of shooting CRT monitors through glass if you go and watch that teaser I think they replaced all the development footage that I did they just reshot it all because they kept having graphical changes and that sort of stuff but I worked mm. on developing that with them and it's, it's, it's become a really big fashion so that's what I have but those can't accept anything other than sort of standard uh, com composite that's it composite video the yellow one <laughs> um, and uh rf but the, the the higher end ones like you have there was one slightly above that you can never find wasn't there, there was a 480p, yeah. Oh, 480p. Oh, yeah there is so right at the, the arse end hd started coming in and basically the the the, the, the very late crt professional crts do accept hd signals so Whilst 480p would be probably the maximum you'd want to put through it, technically, the, the, literally the last model ever made, the 20L5, accepts all the way up to 1080i that you can put through like full, um, well, not full HD, I guess, just HD, you can put through yeah. proper 720p. Um, but that's essentially the, the rarest of the PVMs. I've never seen one come up the whole time. I've been searching for one. Yeah. Um, and I think at this point now, because they're so sought after, I mean, you'd be looking at probably thousands to, to get your hands on one. This reminds me of an interesting experience I had once. I was doing sort of, again, a personal project, filming cool stuff that looks aesthetically pleasing. And, and one of my friends knew someone who worked with... Um, I think it was B Sky B of Sky when they were based in the BT Tower. And they said, oh, do you want to come and have a look ar- around the old rooms in the BT Tower? So I went, okay, cool. So we, we went through some of the new broadcast stuff, which is what you'd imagine, like air-conditioned racks of things going whoosh, and, and looking like modern plastic boxes. Came out in this room and it was like a fucking time warp. Like there was lockers in the corner that had stickers on them for like the unions for the people who worked there and 70s football <laughs> stickers. And then I've still got all this footage. If actually, if we put this on YouTube, I'll see if I can find some footage and cut it in for this bit because it's sitting on my NAS. And there were just rows and rows and rows of these mad old um, cable array ray things. With And that, some of them, if you zoomed in close with the camera, like macro, had a, like a little glass tube with a ball of mercury sitting in it to show pressure and stuff. It was insane. Wow. But then they took us downstairs and, and there was this pile of old CRTs and... Um, Dolby noise reduction cartridges and monitor switches and stuff all taped off with tape and I said what's happening to all that and I said oh it's just been thrown away yeah. we're, just, we're just throwing it away and I was like well, what do you what, what do you mean throwing it? I was like oh well someone's going to pick it up so I think it might have been going to one of those auction things you know where the people they buy it for peanuts because they're willing to pick up and that stuff would have weighed literally tons altogether like it was proper server iron racks but things like those Dolby cartridges I've got a couple of Dolby a noise reduction cartridges they're used in audio production those people just wouldn't have known that but people use them in studios now because it's like an analog effect because it has like this treble enhancing sound they used to use it for carpenters records for the backing vocals it gives that kind of bright sound but those i bet there was some top end pvms now because i remember them being big big bastards as well like absolutely massive monitors just junked essentially i mean i'm just guessing they got auctioned they might have been junked for all i know Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. It, it maddens me. But yeah, you get like this like PVM and then there's actually BVM, broadcast video monitors, which are a step above that as well. The, um, but the amount, yeah, it, it's like, I always think it's like almost like a, a half-life to technology where it goes from like, you know, it starts off and it's like the best you can get and it kind of mm. degrades over time. So it just hits this kind of completely worthless load of shit. And then it, then it actually starts picking up. But at that point, where everyone throws it away, yes. and then it really oh starts getting rare and sought after and needed, and it's then it's going up and up and up to actually it's like something that everyone wanted even more than when it first came out. Yeah, of course, because you know? <laughs> it's now impossible to find, yeah. and you can't recreate it. 
and cars isn't loads of things like that audio equipment is definitely like that like audio equipment now there was a point where there's a you know audio compressors as in compressing the volume dynamic range of audio um you can do that digitally with no problems at all but it has no character to it and people are really fond of a, a, a compressor made by a company called fairchild called the 670 which has some ridiculous like 30 odd valves in it but obviously when they there was a point, like, so now one of those is £15,000 if you can find one and a recreation of it is about £12,000. Is it so hard to get the technology to make it? This all analogue tube technology and the transformers are really expensive. But there was a point where people used them as doorstops and people were literally throwing them into skips because they were seen as totally anachronistic. No one's ever going to want to have this sort of non-linear, distorted, nasty sound. And now, like once we went HD, I never would have thought I'd be filming off a CRT because it looks kind of cool as a visual effect. But now (laughs) it's getting harder and harder to find those fucking things because people want them as a visual effect. And the guy I bought those off of sells that everyone who buys them is some bloke with a ridiculous beard and silly 70s glasses coming to make a music video because they want to put them in the background because they flicker and look weird and make people think of vhs the same with vhs i've got two panasonic vhs camcorders i got on that slightly early enough to get them cheaper one's an m5 and one's an m7 and those are shoulder mount full-size cassette and again it's just because it looks bonkers we'll never be able to make it again and there's going to mm. come a point where people are going to want that as a visual effect and there's hardly any left and there's going to be like 10 people who can fix them. And that's what it's like in some bits of audio now. There's almost no one in London who can fix a tape-based audio delay, you know, like sound gas or a couple of people can fix it. Um, so it's worth an absolute fortune if you have one that works. Well, I think it's always, like, especially with visual effects, it's always quite obvious when it is faked. Like you, yeah. you look at it in like... It's, it's just a shit version of what you know of the real thing. You know, it just doesn't look right. There's um, it's, it was like that scarcity goes all the way down to the, the chips themselves. And the um, I have a scalar device called a Frame Meister mm. um, that you, you plug old consoles in, you put RGB signal into them, and then they will upscale it. Those scalar chips are like really rare now because they accept signals that just aren't prevalent. You know, to 240p isn't, isn't isn't a standard. Never was a standard. Yeah. It was just something like a botch job that worked with CRTs, right? So, no no TV accepts it, and all the technology around it doesn't exist. There was a similar thing with um, there's a for the for the Famicom. Um, to, it doesn't output RGB signal itself. You have to have a, a special board modded into it so it can output RGB. But the color palette to do that to get the actual going through the chip that needs to actually export that color it, it basically doesn't exist either and they've been harvested from some random old arcade board and i think it's called the tim worthington board or something like that and it has this very specific okay. chip there's only like a limited amount left in the world so like mm. <laughs> there's only so many that can be made to actually get the rgb signal out of the nets which <laughs> is going to make looking this thing so it's like a mad geek scramble of like might yeah. only be about a thousand of us who actually want this thing but that's that's the world supply so you have to move yeah. as fast yeah. as you can yeah. to get the thing this is across the board now though because this is not just something that affects yeah i mean it affects everything that i do as well like video stuff is it, it's with lenses for example so there are some that people want like, like old russian ones where something like anything made zenit was like communist stuff so they literally yeah. made millions of them, like 15 million of each particular zenith in their enormous glorious factories of the people so you could so they're still cheap you can buy a I saw an oxfam down the road here in cambridge cambridge uk had a zenith with a helios 44 m lens on it and the entire thing was 30 quid so if it was communist you, you're usually fine but when it's stuff like um particular germanium transistors which are an analog transistor type that that sounds nice for distortion if you overload it it has a great character you have to rely on somebody going into and i watch a lot of urbexes in russia because i find it fascinating russia is so gigantic that when people close the factory some of these are closed in the 60s they just locked the doors and left so a load of these ur- urbexes would go into these old factories and it's like there's all the posters are still there with Lenin on and stuff and they're rooting through and there's all overgrown and water pouring in and this guy like picked up a bag and it had like thousands of enamel Lenin badges or someone picked up this box and it just had, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of these weird little transistor chips which are like ICs, integrated circuits 
you know, they could be for anything. It could be for Russian knockoff synthesizers or they could buy it. So you have to rely on these people. And new old stock valves is another one. Like people find yeah, boxes yeah. of these mullard, British mullard valves in the corner of some place <laughs> in the middle of nowhere in East Germany. And each valve is now like 60 quid. So they've just found a box that's worth like 12 grand <laughs> or something. But it's crazy. We just can't make them anymore. And it's great. It's tooling up bit yeah. by bit. Like, um, Polaroid film, for example, the Impossible bought all of Polaroid stuff. They bought all the old factories, all the old machines. Um, and there are a couple of valve factories, one in China. I think it's like JJ and Sovtech in Russia are using it. They're still using old machines. So eventually, maybe this stuff will be like, even with games and stuff, people will be like, oh, I need a replacement part for a SNES. Someone will have to go and buy the old fabrication shit that people <laughs> used to make a SNES and be like making tiny runs of stuff. Well, that, and they, they have kind of got around to some of that stuff because obviously, as you say, like, so I, I use obviously only um, the original hardware. You know, you want to have all the idiosyncrasies in the original hardware. You want to get the best possible signal. But there is that, for a that craft company. beer review. It's like the craft beer. <laughs> <thing. laughs> yeah, well, it's probably the easiest way, right? You know, yep. otherwise you got to go around it. But the, there's that company, Analog NT, that. Um, or is NT the product? Uh, they, they call it analog something or other. They um, they first started off with the, their NES, but they used um, an FPGCA, whatever you call it. You know, uh, oh, FPGA, fast programmable yeah. gate array. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so they they but they've like done it all, you know, perfectly. Now they've released like a SNES, and they have a, a Mega Drive or a Genesis right. version as well, and it is actually like just as good. So there is some hope around that for sure. Yeah, that's like next level emulation. <laughs> that's tough. So, yeah. so, so in that sort of context, an FPGA is being used to sort of physically, physically probably the wrong word, but like to emulate a chip directly and how the, how its logic gates work is the idea. Yeah, oh. I, mean, that's, I mean, I'm not an expert on it, but I mean, that's, yeah, you, you're programming the chip, so you directly uh, emulate it in hardware rather than in software. So you actually are getting the exact kind of, chip out of it without having to actually um you know actually fab the chip yourself you're just having a chip that you're molding into what you want it to be it's pretty cool pretty cool technology really yeah that has popped up in pro audio but as well as a company called antelope audio he uses fpga chips in their audio interfaces to give you like processing plugins that are based on those chips so those chips are like re it's, it's out of my field Really, as well, I've understand them. I guess those chips are re reconfiguring themselves to act like other processors. I guess is the idea. But yeah, we probably shouldn't yeah. get too far into it because we just look like knobs because <laughs> we right. don't really know how it works. I don't even remember what the letters are yeah. <laughs> in the chip name. So we don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far. Anyway, there was something else I, I thought would be worth talking about because instead of just raw tech, like actual game stuff, and there's a couple I could pick from that have been on my mind, but um with the release of Cyberpunk 2077 coming up. So I, I'd never really played The Witcher, but over Christmas, last Christmas, not this misery lockdown Christmas, but the one when we were still able to be free and happy human beings, um, there was The Witcher series came on and they put them all down for cheap. So I got Witcher 3 and I installed it. It took me a year to get around to installing it, basically. Um, but it's really enjoyable and it has a, a massive first player storyline. One, one first player, one player storyline. And I remember thinking... Um, God, I mean, this seems like it's going to go for a long time. I'll have a look at how long it is. And it, it, it came up in the search, 50-something hours, not including the DLC, which adds to that. And then shortly after I looked up that, um, uh, CD Projekt Red, the developers, said they're going to cut the size of the storyline in it because nobody bothered to finish it in Witcher 3. <laughs> like, no one actually got through the damn thing. They made me think about this sort of stuff with games. Like, how many... Maybe it's an age thing. Like, when I was younger, I'd grind a bit harder. But how many do you actually finish now and how many are you willing to persist with because i i don't really enjoy that the sort of you know the ubisoft identikit thing where they just move this massive open world hundreds of side quests thing through different environments and just remake the same game i don't enjoy those anymore i like the story and i like the main combat and stuff but i just don't enjoy ticking boxes to 100 percent. it drives you mad yeah yeah and the the, the problem we have now which yeah, if, if, if there was half the problem was when you're younger, you don't have disposable income to buy every game. But now, yeah. not only do we have the money to get any game we want, there are yeah. more games, and there are billions of free games as well. So you have like yeah. unbelievable choice, which has led to the point where, unless something's absolutely amazing, 
you and you're really sucked in and really want to play it, you probably aren't going to finish it. Um, so yeah, it's definitely one of the bigger challenges I think uh, these days, actually getting through the games. I've uh, I had a good run this year actually. I finished probably five or six really big games. Yeah, I'm not talking kind of like indie games or anything, like yeah. all the way through to the end of them. And it, it is really satisfying when you do get into a game, you know, you, you, and it's it's a bit like, you know, you're reading a book or something and it, it, it ends and you have this kind of mm. emptiness because like you've yeah. got it's over. Um, yeah. But it, it, is, it is harder and harder to, to find those games for sure. And uh, that Ubisoft thing you're describing is, is exactly one of the problems. It's more of like, they, they're using game theory on you that you will go and pick up every breadcrumb if they lay yeah. it so, you know, at the part just enough that you get this satisfaction of level up now get the next breadcrumb rather than you're actually enjoying it on some other mm. level yes, or actually enjoying it at all the, the, the worst yeah. one I found for that in the last couple of years which I um, I mean it's you know because I'm um, we're 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 all we're all PC master race here, so it means it's cheap because you'll get Steam sales. So you know that's one of the reasons I think you end up with tons of games you just don't finish as well as because they're so cheap. And if you ever do humble bundles, you get tons of stuff you never even install it, let alone play it. Mm-hmm. But um, one of them was that Mad Max game. So on the on the face of it, it looked like quite a cool idea, and it's like okay, you drive the car around, mm-hmm. you go and take these settlements down, and all that. But very quickly, I was like, every aspect of this is like a sort of combination of um i think what you're describing is game theory but like that reward thing where it's like everything you do gives you a little box and goes whooshing and then it like you've leveled up your tires and you've like and you've got you've got a new bit for max's outfit and then go over here and do there's five of these towers to do and ten of these settlements and i just thought well but it's the same thing over and over again there's only sort of five type of thing and they just yeah. get harder than that thing yeah. And it's all a it's bit a fake deep, as well. Uh-huh. Like the the sense of achievement is so. Um, yeah. It's what's the word for it? It's slightly patronising. They're basically saying, yeah, but we know that if we just give you ten boxes and they're all grayed off and you gradually unlock them, even if there's no sense of direction that you're choosing yourself, it's just like if you play from the beginning to end, you will unlock all of these. You'll still feel a sense of satisfaction when it goes bing and unlocks. Yeah. But it's it's not that's not real character development. It's not real story progression, and it isn't even real anything progression. Is that you could you could do away with all of this like the levels of your car or whatever and just give me a story and I'd be happier. But it exactly. seems to often replace actually bothering to write a tale that you care about. Exactly, exactly. And that's when it's actually the, the worst defending for it because you get sucked in from the trailer, right? Which is probably something you're going to work on soon, <laughs> breaking people's dreams. But you start with <laughs> something like Mad Max. I had the same experience with uh, Ghost of Tsushima lately. You think it's going to be some sort of, you know, atmospheric, story-driven, amazing kind of tale. You say you're, you're actually, like, living, mm-hmm. and then you soon realise, actually, when, as, as soon as you get that first cover mission, it's like, this is a bamboo stick. Like, yes. you have across the map. You're like, okay, uh, so there's going to be, like, 80 bamboo sticks. Yeah. There's going to be 10 of these types of outposts, and you're just ticking these things off. The same thing with... Um, Horizon Zero Dawn, you know, it, it looks amazing. And it's normally yeah. as well, the intros are incredible. The intros yeah, are good. really carefully crafted. You're walking through, everyone's talking to you, crazy things are happening. You think this game is amazing. Then it's open world, okay. Actually, we just put an open world and we've got the editor and just plonk this thing here and this thing here and we're, we're mm. done. Yeah, it's that promise of the notion of open world has been very much betrayed in recent years i think i, I know it's big language you've ever been betrayed <laughs> this is not what we were promised but it's yeah, I, remember, never this blow. <laughs> I remember playing gta 3 and that's a small enough world and you were like yeah this is really cool and then i remember when it got to san andreas and um, it was so big that i felt like <laughs> the city dwarfed the experience and they, there was so much of real life stuff and like you have to make cj eat borgar and work out and he has a girlfriend and you have to like oh god i've got to go on a date with my girlfriend oh, for god's sake it was like that that's no longer a game it's like it's like another <laughs> really stressful life yeah. that i don't want to live so there's well, a balance like to be struck four, nico it's your cousin you know you gotta go yeah. it's just Fuck off! I'm trying to have fun in a game. Don't play darts with me. You fucking annoy me while I'm playing my game. (laughs) It's like I've got I've got people asking me to come and play darts while I'm trying to play GTA 4. I don't need it in (laughs) GTA 4 as well. Yeah, it's like that. There's, there was a I'm open world is a is a promise that's really attractive on the face of it, isn't it? You're like um. 
oh, I can just enter a completely separate version of reality and live and exist in it, right? But it, it never turns out like that. It turns out with sort of uh, regenerated quests and... Um, like the chore of real life somehow enters this fantastical world that's supposed to be an escape from it. And it, it's hard to find. Like The Witcher, I started playing it and I, I, there was a side quest and I thought, right, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to do a side quest and see if it is boring. And this was a side quest mentioned in dialogue by the one of the characters. So when I got to the side quest, it's fully charactered and written and it's really good. But I'm guessing that even in that game, eventually if you go to the notice boards and start taking on side quests, they're going to come to the point where it's like, oh yes, my chickens have been stolen and I'll give you a few florins if you go and find them for me and you can probably do the chicken quest in a hundred places around the map I don't, I don't know it's like a it's a combination of that that filler like filler is the worst thing in an album or whatever like you know it's there just to fill space and also um, a bit being just slightly patronising like you know if we can give you anything and you'll be happy i'd much rather have a focused storyline i think than a whole open world full of box ticking it seems so sad to use yeah. to put so much of that in no, i completely agree i mean that's that's the problem with open world games they, they feel dead right and the, the closer we get to having um proper hardware and procedure generated worlds that actually have meaning it, the better those worlds are going to become but at the moment they have to be crafted by, by humans properly and that either ends in with just people making things that just aren't realistic other doors that can't be opened yeah. places you can't go that makes a world that doesn't feel very convincing but I, I do you think we're, we are moving towards you know a, a place where they could be convincing like the world of Red Dead um, is open world and it, they picked a really clever time, right? Because they, well, it's basically a good time to have an open world because towns aren't very big on the frontier, so you don't have to model yes, much yeah. of it. But every single building, you know, you can go in, there's different things going on in them. Like it, it does feel then much more grounded, like you're in, in an actual place that makes sense. So, you know, if we can get to that position, I think we could be in, a, in, in something that could be very convincing. I guess that's probably what Rockstar's ultimate ambition mm. is right to have that that gta online ultimate you know that mm. one city that you know they tried to do a gta 5 but maybe 15 20 years from now there's one city so detailed or they keep on adding details that people just never leave you know it just yeah. it's just so rich i mean it's, it links well to cyberpunk in two ways one because they're gonna have to walk a fine line between that sort of giving you enough freedom to enjoy the world but um also give you a story that you care about um, but too, because so much cyberpunk literature itself and futuristic literature from way back when in the 80s always talked about this thing. I mean, everyone's been, like William Gibson and um, Michael Marshall Smith and all these people were obsessed with the notion of being able to live in a virtual world. And we are, I think we are gradually approaching that. Um, and I'm sure procedural generation will have to be a part of it. But when you talked about like a the small towns on the frontier, that's an interesting point because something like cyberpunk, it's a whole idea of cyberpunk is cultural density and within a physical space isn't it you'll you'll be in 10 square meters there'll be masses of flashing neon signs and tons of noise and every culture's mashed together um mm -hmm. becomes one sort of neon mess that's got to be an incredibly hard thing to sort of i mean i'm, I'm assuming yeah. they will be using procedural stuff behind the scenes like houdini which is a program that that plugs into a lot of engines and helps you procedurally generate stuff within a level creation and that kind of thing and procedural um procedural code sections like blueprints or whatever within levels to help them lay out stuff fast but there's still tons of manual labor that has to go into that to to, to build that world and that's an incredibly complex task to make it convincing yeah. and dense like that compared to like the wild yeah. west like you say where you can just put desert oh, i just have five miles of desert here if you want you know yeah a little bit more dense. I mean, it's a lot better that way right because yeah a, li a little bit as you say crafted by hand is worth a ton right now of poorly made procedurally generated stuff mm. so we just haven't got the technology yet to make it convincing or, or worth exploring when it hasn't been made by a human it's going to be very interesting to see how cyberpunk actually plays because yeah. it's first person which is normally quite jarring for something like that yeah. um but as you say, it has to be a huge city, and that was one of the things they did well in The Witcher, right? Because you've got 
what's the main city called? I've forgotten. Uh, that, that city is actually pretty detailed, loads of places you can go in, you know, if, even if there's nothing in there, you can walk in and you can see everyone's yeah. house and stuff. Like, but if you've got like Mega City One with 2,000 skyscrapers <laughs> going into the, into the into the stratosphere, like how that, you can't have that all open and <laughs> usable, yeah. can you? So, I don't know if it's going to be restricted to one tiny area or something. It's, it's hard oh. to imagine how it works. There's a, there's a, program that lots of people use in film and game development called houdini which is used for procedural generation of stuff so if you're if you're going to make a big wave crashing over a city houdini's probably been used to simulate the fluids that sort of thing simulate the fluids but um, if, if you're going to make a, a say a skyscraper generator for unreal 4 you can build a thing in houdini that has all these parameters and then every copy, of, you can drop copies of it into your scene and then change the parameters for each copy. So it doesn't, because it's a copy of one chunk of code, it doesn't stress the engine as much, but you can make like slightly varied things. So that's one of the many ways that people have of, in a game engine, taking one or two things that are kind of the same bit of code, but making them look really different. So I can imagine they might do a lot of stuff like that for all of the upcoming games like GTA 6 whenever that comes out and Cyberpunk where there's going to be they'll be recognisably similar after after a time you'll probably recognise the patterns in these buildings and stuff but they'll have just enough different that you all feel like a slightly different there's lots of trickery I'd have thought it really feels amazing though you have it uh, in something like The Last of Us 2 where obviously it's uh, you know path the linear adventure right where you're basically going around it gives an impression that you're in, a, in an open world but you very rarely are but that you go through absolutely tons and tons of rooms people's houses and places every single house has been like thought about and given like a almost like a theme about what their family did and everything like there was one well, I don't know whether it's a spoiler or not, really. But well, there's the spoiler well. alert, so you can say no. alert. I haven't played but it, but I don't mind if you spoil one thing. It's the least of all spoilers. There's one place you go in, and um, there's a bunch of guys who are living in a flat, and they've got a, a D&D uh, table all set up. And like, because it's like so detailed, you can go into literally zoom right in to see exactly what they're doing, read all the law that they're writing <laughs> and stuff, all the stuff on the walls, everything. Like, there's just an ama- amazing like touch. Of, there's no point to it at all. Mm. You, you you could just run straight through it. But I spent like ten minutes in that in the house, just yeah. looking around, searching through everything, reading all the silly notes and things, just because it was such an amazing little touch, you know. Mm. Like, and it was actually just packed full of it. That game. You never walked in and thought, oh, there's that generic bar or that generic kitchen i've seen 10 times yeah. it was different every single time that's what really made that, that incredible world they created i mean i've never played the first or the second one but because i didn't have a i still don't have a console and i've been meaning to get a sony one at some point because they've got so many cool exclusives like that but um i've been told by loads of people that last of us was actually genuinely involving and you actually cared about people in it and the second one was even better i have followed yeah. a lot of the artists on twitter and art station which is a cool site to go on if you just like looking at game concept art especially on art station is is wicked but yeah there's, there's people who've done um lots of different concept artists and so on who've done an environment artist for last of us the amount of detail and pride that they've clearly taken over one room like you say i haven't played it but i can definitely believe what you're talking about that someone someone will have painted a beautiful concept art piece for that room with the D setup and then someone will have gone and started to model it and then they've textured and then people will be down there like you say writing out the law with the writers and making sure that looked like handwriting and it's a phenomenal undertaking it really is like the ultimate Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art. It's like a phrase from modernism, I think. But yeah, it's one of my favourite words. The total work of, of art um, games now with this sort of stuff. The high end is just like, it's like the 50s golden age of Hollywood. So all these amazing artists, amazing in their field, pulling together to create a believable fantasy world. It's something else when it really hits. And then when it doesn't, it's um, you're just running around collecting chopsticks or whatever you're talking, bamboo, which is no fun. Yeah, and that's not to say The Last of Us is like perfect in that way. The environments are incredible, but it's still a game. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. a bit of a collectathon in itself. Like because you're always scavenging things, I did find myself like running in kind of weird motions where I'm like I'm like hugged to the wall, like you know, pressing whatever it is, circle, circle, circle. You know, can I pick up? Can I pick up? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Sort of weird uh, 
maze runner autist or something that's trying to find the, <laughs> the ultimate efficient route to get all the items through the game. But yeah, it, it is definitely a, a next uh, next step up. If you if you wanted to play it, the best thing to do would be to get a, a PS5 because not just because it's it's new, but I think all of the classic exclusive PS4 games are included with the PS5, so you you can oh, just wow. play all of them. For real? Yeah. So, yeah, you might have to have PlayStation Plus, perhaps, but I mean, you could get that, you know, for, for nothing. And then you have like this, like massive list of like God of War, Last of Us, Ghost of Tsushima, you know, all of their exclusives. They got probably a big list, like must yeah, be at least that, 15, God of War so. and, and Last of Us are the two that I'm really missing in the sense of I've wanted to, to play. Yeah. And I, I did yeah. actually play the beginning of it around yours on aforementioned Giant oh, yeah. TV, and it was pretty stunning. Wiki <laughs> comes out, and has to, you have to battle with him. It's pretty hard. Yeah, I mean that, that stuff is like it was really cool. I I believed all the characters immediately, and then um, and then that, that it's like technical stuff was brilliant on it. it was, considered it was a console game, like all that um, like the deforming snow stuff looked wicked when it was running about, and it's just like immersive, immersive AF for that sort of thing. Yeah, it looked really for good. Sure. Yeah, that sounds like yeah. a plan. <laughs> that is, uh, if we do further recordings like this, that is a running theme. They're trying to convince each other to spend money, isn't it? So you're trying to convince me to buy a PS5 before it's even released. Yeah, you're just, just the best way to do it is just buy the most expensive new console you can. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> You'll get your money's worth. Um, I was going to ask you, basically. So I can see the Vectrex behind you. I, mm. I also have a Vectrex, which oh, yes. is just... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I know you got one of the uh, plastic uh, covers on there. Oh, is yeah. did you buy the 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 remade set of covers, or was that just one random games cover? Uh, this one is it came with an actual. This this camera should autofocus. Yeah, just about. So just, just that's just one one games. Yeah, so this is this is Hyperchase, which is yeah. I just, uh, that's one of my favourite games. They're all obviously very very simple. Um, but it's just sort of really fast and crazed, um, and yeah, it's a really really simple one as well. You know, it's just green, green and blue, green to be like land and blue to be sky because that's what the world is—just land and sky. Um, it, but I, you can get um, someone made a set of like repros of all of them, but they're horrendously expensive. I think there was something like eight pounds per uh, overlay. And there's like obviously you know thirty overlays. He's <laughs> <laughs> looking at a serious amount of money for, for something that's basically just a piece of perspex. You know, <laughs> like, and then I bought this. I, I think you have the same perspex. thing, which is the uh, the uh, yeah yeah, yeah uh, multi cart, which I used. The, I used like the literally the cheapest Vectrex game I could to nick the cartridge from. Focus, well, focus, so I, focus, I, focus. I tried to do that actually. Um, might be it's over there somewhere, but I. I I, I got a, a crappy game, cracked it, pulled off the label, cracked it open, only to find that there's different types of Vectrex oh, car. Unlikely. And I had one, the one type that doesn't fit properly. So after just destroying a piece of history, <laughs> <laughs> I just had to throw it in the bin. Basically. So I feel really bad well about that, being a, a prolific collector of games. Yeah, yeah. I've destroyed that. But, yeah. yeah, I think I have a couple. You can use it case anyway you just shove it in not that i've ever actually used the flash cart which is my shame i've never actually plugged in i got, I've it, got scramble here it. as well i think this was i think this came with because i i thought i i've got a few few screens here actually so i watched this on um watched it on ebay for ages and ages until i found one i was just like it was one of those couldn't believe my luck buy it now so it's really cheap it's like a hundred and something quid boxed and everything with games and i thought buy it now and I was waiting for the catch and there was none I just got I was just that lucky bastard that day um, yeah, it's right. got the Mindstorm one but that that's broken and been re-taped back together mm. which is a bit of a, a bit of a shame autofocus mm. brilliant as usual there on the Panasonic and then what's this one? Oh, Scramble yeah this is uh, that's that's Scramble, green yeah. and orange and red uh, and fuel level but yeah I, I also love how the controls are written at the bottom there where it says bomb laser bomb laser <laughs> which um, <laughs> refers to the four buttons on the front because there's so many different controls escape yeah. thrust and fire but yeah the, the best ones are still like oh have you played the Star Trek oh thank you focus that's excellent well done there we go um, have you played the Star Trek game it was branded as Star Trek and also branded as another thing but it's like a first person 3D vector space shooting game and it's actually full 3D it's ridiculous. No, I, I think 
I, I said a moment ago, like, I'm not sure I've ever actually booted up the uh, flashcard. Like, maybe once I did, uh, but I've never really been through the, the back catalogue. I've only played the game that I bought with it. The weird thing about the Vectrex is it's not as old as you think. You look at it and you think it's from like 1973 or something. But is it from like 86 or something? No, 82 it came out. I think it's 82, like, yeah. 83 yeah, like, that's right. kind of like you know Atari uh, you know the NES came out in 85 I'm pretty sure yeah so well, it's, it's uh, not that old in my opinion yeah. anyway maybe it's old but <laughs> to me it feels like it's not that as, old as old as you and I effectively <laughs> yeah but see yeah, it's kind of surprising I mean you the reason I ended up buying one was because I went to the in Cambridge. There's the there's like a museum of computing history. There's a couple yeah. of them in the country. I've been to been to two. Of, I think there's another one up north as well. But I've been to the one where they have Witch and all of in that. Nottingham you know. or Norwich, one of those. There's yeah, a, I think it's not, the Milton Keynes. Sorry, I think is the that's the. I've been to the Centre for Computing History one that that has Witch and the machine that broke the Enigma code. You know all that stuff. And then also yeah. there's one in Cambridge, which is sort of more domestic things. And I went to one of the one in Cambridge's open nights where they just had all these old consoles. And they even have stuff like a networked original 486 or whatever it was, Doom game, which is really good, or Quake, which is really that's fun. Good. I'm um, just looking okay. it up now. So it's in, in, there's one in Sheffield. I think that's the official one. Right. Uh, uh, National Video Game Museum in uh, Sheffield. I've been to the one in uh, Berlin as well, the... Uh, I can't remember the German for it, but Spiel or something or other. That was pretty cool because I was just walking up um, Karl Marx Alley because I go to Germany quite a lot, I go to Berlin quite a lot. Yeah. And I just saw it like written in German, like computer in Spiel, but I was like, yes. like half broken German. I was like, that sounds like game. <laughs> Is that a computer game? museum in like an old soviet yes. building like beautiful so i was like this i've got to check out go in there yeah sure enough it's actually just ram full of like ultra fucking well for me ultra cool computer game stuff yeah it's quite quite a shock just to walk into it i've been to berlin a fair bit as well and i didn't know that was there was one of those knocking around in east berlin i'll have to check it out next time i'm there Oh, the other one I was talking about was Bletchley Park. So it's not really computer games, yeah. it's just computing. That's the other thing I've been to. Yeah, you couldn't really play games on those. But yeah, I ended up buying it because I, it was just the most surreal thing at that show. Like everything, nothing else there had vector graphics. And I remember I was playing Mindstorm for absolutely ages because it was so hard and so weird. And, but it was sort of abstractly beautiful, this just weird glowing lines and buzzy sound. And I thought that's like... It's just a bit trippy. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and there's nothing else quite like it. So I ended up trying to buy one and, and, and succeeded eventually. Um, but it's always made me think about like how things loop back round and if there'll ever be a chance for vectors to be somehow useful again as graphics. Like I was thinking of ideas of like how that could reduce the workload on things pixel wise. So instead of making a rastered thing, you just made sort of vectored shape areas of visual display or that sort of thing. But I, I guess it's all stuff that gets thought about by people who are far more intelligent <laughs> and do this stuff for a living. But, um, but I do wonder if there'll ever be a use for this technology again, one that we just don't think of right now, but somehow vectors have become useful <laughs> in, an, in another way. Yeah, there's um, there's a game I just got a couple of days ago um, called Teardown. I don't think I've mentioned this to you yet, mm. but it's um, it, talking of old technologies that are, actually are super useful. What no one ever uses is the you know, the voxel, the, the oh, yeah, volume yeah. pixel. <laughs> Essentially, you, you, know, you can have these kind of three D pixels, yeah. and it uses this voxel engine. I think it's some. I don't want to get it wrong, but I'm pretty sure he might be Russian, this guy. He's like just one man band anyway, independent gamer. And he's, uh, he's basically created this new engine that's all got all volumetric um, lighting, like completely destructible environments, uh, volumetric like smoke effects, everything. I think it even has some sort of software ray tracing that he's built into it. Um, it's like a labor of love. It's a really cool game. Like you should, you should check it out. To be honest, I think you really, really like it. Obviously, it runs it like absolute dog shit. But like, <laughs> it's using like every calculation in the world to do every single thing. It's called Teardown, and it, 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 basically because it's a structural environment, he's built this game around the idea of smashing everything up. So it's yeah. almost like a, 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 
a weird kind of Minecraft. If Minecraft looked amazing and the, and the blocks were tiny kind of thing. So, but yeah, it's it's like a, like a toy sandbox thing. But you made a campaign around it. There's a, a map editor, even though it's been out two days, people are going nuts already building whole worlds in it. <laughs> uh, just the technical marvel is it's worth it. I think you're saying this runs like absolute ass on your brand new 3080 as well. So. Yeah, yeah, I can only run in 1440p. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> both well. <laughs> I know. Is this a VR thing as well? It's VR no, no, well. it's just, just uh, normal. Yeah, it's pretty good. Well, we're talking of running as ass, I got um, running as ass, running like <laughs> ass. Um, <laughs> Watch Dogs Legion, as ass. running as my ass. Uh, Watch Dogs Legion just runs like absolute dog shit as well. Like right. uh, just that with the King Free with the thirty eight D, which you think someone would have checked. Mm. Can it even run the thirty eight D? Because it's going to be embarrassing <laughs> if not. And no, it can't. <laughs> no. no. If you turn on any RTX. It's just an absolute joke. And I mean, like, I'm running it, I think, 1440p with performance DLSS on. So mm. it's running, like, sub, yeah, like sub 1080p or something. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, a lot of upscaling. It's something it's, ridiculous. It's, it's like eight times or... Not good, yeah. It's still, yeah. like, dipping below 60 frames per second with the lowest oh. RTX on, which is very disappointing because it looks incredible. Although I just saw a um, digital foundry video came out and uh, they normally give you kind of the ideal settings to make it actually run properly right. so it out afterwards I mean there is this early adopter cancer that you get on everything now isn't there whether it's a game or a piece of hardware or whatever nothing works when it first comes out it's pretty sad but it's part of the course is you're likely to have have issues with settings and stuff I, I remember um, when I first got 28 ETIs in a machine I got a pair of them in this machine for work and obviously that means you can game and do VR and I was expecting so much more out of RTX but also so much more performance in general like there's some games that I love like we both play Project Cars 2 in VR and it just performance wise it never really gets there like as soon as you get the index you've got more pixels to chuck around so it looks worse on the low settings where you could have more effects and suddenly it looks really dry with no effects and runs slowly it's like when when is this stuff actually going to run well and then there's so much stuff now where people are like cranking rtx settings and you have to run it with dlss and even when you do you can't get a decent frame rate i was very disappointed in a lot of these um things as they came out also using unreal engine um i thought oh well i've got rtx now i'll be able to ray trace everything in real time absolute nonsense i mean you just cannot as soon as you go for global illumination more than a few samples the denoiser can't keep up and it's speckly as soon as you take it up enough samples to get rid of the speckling uh the frame rate tanks to like 15 fps so it's, it's never been full real-time real tra ray tracing it's like certain elements you can have ray trace for like reflections and uh, transparency is a bit heavy as well. It's like reflections and a couple of other little bits. Uh, um, ambient occlusion are, are quite light. But everything else is just torture on the engine. So uh, they, it could be they've just switched all of it on and gone, well, screw it. Eventually, everything's going to catch up to this. <laughs> we'll, we'll put it all to max. But they really need to let you switch reflections, GI, all this stuff separately now because it's so, some bits of that are so heavy. Like GI is so heavy. Yeah, it's, it's the resolution that kills it as well. I mean, do I just mentioned with VR, the resolution, you can never get enough of it right, so you would need more and more horsepower. And it kind of winds me up as well, because people, I really love Reddit and stuff, and the people always are like, you know, they'll say, oh, a 38 overkill for anyone, you just don't need it. And it's like, not true. <laughs> like, in, the, in most games, you can barely still even hit 60 FPS, with even the best hardware, you know, if you want to put on things on Ultra, which is kind of my expectation, if you've got the best card and you spend all that money, you can yeah, max out yeah. the graphics on something, and then you, you literally can't do it. You never seem to have quite enough headroom to, to pull it off, unless, of course, it's id tech, and then you've got about 5,000 frames per second yeah. <laughs> left in the can. Yeah, that Doom Eternal engine is ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, it's just comical how many <laughs> frames it can pull off i don't know what it is they do when they build that but this the the levels of optimization they must go through to get things working that smoothly it's all vulcan based isn't it vulcan graphics api it's vulcan's their preferred yeah mm. i think it probably defaults to it now um but when, when it first came out it didn't even have vulcan support they kind of added yeah. it in and 
I mean, not Doom Eternal, but Doom 2016. Yeah, yeah. yeah it runs at locked. I, I was just testing it again earlier. Now it's running at locked 120 with everything cranked to um, Ultra Nightmare, whatever the top thing is, yeah. at, at um, 4K, which is quite a sight to behold, to be honest. So yeah. it's, it's quite impressive. And this is G-Synced as well. Yeah, it's well, G-Sync, but I mean, once, you, once you're locked at 120, you don't really need G-Sync because yeah, that's uh, smooth out the, uh, thing, the yeah. tearing. That's bananas. Well, I'm, I'm not going to have that experience anytime soon, but uh, <laughs> I look forward to coming around and seeing it with my own eyes and see, what a feeling my eyes melt as I, <laughs> I play it at 4K HDR 120. But um, yeah, what 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 was it that triggered us to be sending loads and loads of voice messages back and forth? It was probably the the same thing lots of people in the tech and PC world have been talking about, which is the three thousand series launch and the fact that it's next to impossible to get hold of a card. Uh, but you've got one. I've indeed got one. Got very lucky from a, a Telegram chat group that allowed to me some stock on scan straight in there. Managed to nab one, tried to get you on as well, but didn't <laughs> quite go to plan. Which is because um, you were on a pre order list, weren't you? At something like number, well, you'd got, you'd got down from number 800 to about 750 in two weeks or something. It was ridiculous. Quite bad. It started around just, yeah, just over 800, got down to, I think, 20 down. So it's about, uh, yeah, 20, 20 places in one and a half weeks, which I did some quick maths, and it was six months at that rate. Um, but, you know, Finally got one. So that's actually pretty good. So plug the bad boy in now. Got a few games going, um, but had a bit of an adventure trying to get the 120 hertz out of the old TV here. So finally got there, though. What's your TV then? You've got um, a top end thing, which you go, haven't you? Like a, it's, it's massive as well, isn't yeah. it? Like 60 odd inch. Exactly. I think it's just like the holy grail of things at the moment. So there's always been kind of a compromise you have to make, right, with especially with large displays. So it's going to be like the response time, you know, the, how quickly it can actually display the images, you know, resolution, anything you think of is going to always have some sort of problem. But mm. it's the, just first time ever, the C9 was just like the perfect, perfect TV, basically. It every single feature. Yeah, LG, LG C9. Yeah, so it just basically has 120 hertz, HDR, OLED response, um, you know, actually has 12-bit color, supposedly. Mm. HDMI 2.1, but therein lies the, the problem. There are no HDMI 2.1 graphics cards until enter yeah. the, the 3000 series. So excitedly tried to find one, but spent the last uh, month of disappoint only to finally get one to find out that Actually, no one's ever tested such a device before on a, on a HDMI 2.1 TV, and it still doesn't exist. So I spent all weekend trying to hack my way into having a working device. And this was to get um, every single possible top-end feature of graphics working at once, wasn't it? So 120 yeah, yeah. hertz, 4K, HDR, 10 bits. Um, what's the last one? G-Sync. Yeah, so it's like, and, and even um, NVIDIA themselves, I think they, they do call it like G-Sync Ultimate, and that's the certification where you have all of those features all working together, <coughs> but it uses the full 48 gigabit of um, bandwidth Oof. bus and HDMI 2.1, which basically means that it doesn't work. <laughs> so you've only got a headroom of about one bit <laughs> before the whole thing just crashes. Um, so after upgrading the wire, which is the first thing you have to do, because obviously all the wires you bought, which were previously only a week before, mm. the, the, the best possible wire you could get are now completely useless. So I'm going to do that, which I'm going to have to do as well for the, the, all, the, all the consoles too. So that's just added expense to find out that actually there's still a bug that means that the G-Sync elements doesn't work. Um, but... Luckily, it was just a quick fix. I just had to order a remote control from Amazon from China that allowed me to, to get into the engineer's own custom menu, force it to do a firmware upgrade it didn't want to do. And then luckily, that didn't actually fix it. I then had to go through a whole rigmarole of putting my computer into safe mode, going through one of those crazy instruction sets of, you know, like jump up and down five times, turn it off for at least 15 minutes, kind of advice that he knows absolutely 
bullshit in like, the digital world cannot make a single bit of difference yet. <laughs> about 10 other people go, yeah, I did 10 minutes, it didn't work, but 15 minutes, it works. So, <laughs> it's a ritual, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Fucking occult <Yeah>. ritual. <laughs> finally. Make finally, three I've revolutions with the shins. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it works. And, and I've got to say, it is, you know, I've, I've probably been through... I don't know, three or four big epoch moments in gaming, like the advent of 3D accelerators, then the move to 3D in consoles, move to HD, the move maybe even to Ultra HD. Uh, but I think this is genuinely like the next big move in, in PC gaming. Mm. Once, once you see how smooth, perfect, like the, the colors popping out, the, the highlights, everything, it's just, it's just next level. It just, it looks incredible. It feels incredible. It's just exactly what you always hoped PC gaming would be like. I don't think I can ever go back. Yeah, it's one of those things, that, like the resolution, because obviously that jump to HD for everyone, or not just for like, um, you know, home watching films and games, but also for content creation stuff was wicked. Like being able to do something that looked visibly that much sharper, but the jump up to 4K... Um, still most stuff is maybe not most but a lot of stuff is still distributed in, in, in HD and consumed in HD in fact it wasn't even until the most recent iPhone you couldn't actually watch in 4K on YouTube like it was still locked to 1080 if I remember rightly or the yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't just the recent iPhone it was yeah all iPhones just were 1080p only um, it was only iOS 14 that's just unlocked um, above mm. 1080p um, they did have HDR before that but mm. yeah they were way over 1080p resolution but, the screens um, themselves 4K was like it was good for acquisition because you could super you were super sampling, which kind of gets over the fact that that sensors are Bayer array sensors and aren't really the resolution they sort of claim to be anyway. So you could get sort of yeah. true HD out of 4K and you can get true 4K, 8K, whatever. But, uh, but yeah. most of it's distributed in 1080. So it was a big thing for capture, but I, I didn't really watch that much in 4K. And a lot of things when I did AB test it because I am a nerd enough to try that out. It is hard to tell the difference at normal distances with normal screen sizes. Yeah. But um, HDR is like that is a huge change it looks much more like film like really nicely done developed yeah. film that massive dynamic range smooth highlight roll offs the black isn't crushed out you know it's such a huge jump so to get that plus things like g-sync or free sync i guess will come at some point with it since since we have new ati cards out um yeah well the brr is the, the term in, in tv technology right the is the you know, variable refresh rate which is um basically compatible with FreeSync 2 and now G-Sync when they mm. opened up the standard. So yeah, I think it, I think they can both do it already directly onto the TVs. VR. Oh, is that like a sort of universal bit at the top that can talk yeah. to G-Sync and FreeSync? So. Exactly, yeah. It's just that if you're VR certified, then you are able to be compatible with, yeah. So actually, like, weirdly, the Xbox One, as in even the original one, I believe, is compatible with VRR. And VRR is part of the HDMI 2.1 spec sheet, but um, the Xbox One already has it, so you can actually enable kind of a kind of free sync on Xbox One, uh, you know, not the series or anything, but the, the old ones. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's bonkers, really. Are those, um, yeah, so it's been a, a bit of a mission trying to get hold of 3080s. So after you got your card, I took your place in the queue, then I realised that because it's one of the souped-up ones, it's so it's such a massive chode of a card. It doesn't actually fit in my case, so I'm going to have to get a new case. The things we suffer <laughs> for for this sort of for, for technology, but I'm after it mainly for the productivity stuff because the CUDA scores are, you know, thirty to fifty percent higher. Um, so I'm hoping that some people will see the new ATI I cards for gaming and cancel their 3080 orders hopefully and push me up the queue a bit but I'm not really I don't know I'm not sure that's necessarily going to happen because a lot of people are really into RTX and I think and it will trust I think it will happen, though. I think it's already starting to happen um, I've heard of quite a few people cancelling even before the um, AMD cards but now that they've seen they could be decent the only thing that'll be the big problem will be is one we don't actually have the benchmarks out yet so <laughs> it yeah. could just be smoking mirrors and two, we, their availability, they're likely to have a lot of the same problems, right? You know, they've mm. probably got very similar components that are messing up the supply chain on NVIDIA's side. Uh, and if, if they're not available either, then I'm not sure how much difference it make. Why cancel one pre-order to start another year and lower down the queue, potentially? Do you know when those are supposed to come out? 
What's the actually, I, don't, I was thinking about that. I mean, look, but I don't actually look when they're out. It's got to no, be very no It's got to be November. Well, based on nothing but just gut feeling, but I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it, it must is. be. <laughs> yeah, you realize you can't just lie when you're on camera. No, no. I definitely oh, that. can you? <laughs> <laughs> At least they were out yesterday. I bought them all. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So for the the kind of. Well, not really mid range, but the, the high mid range on the 6,800 range, that's our 18th of November. Mm. But then the 1390 equivalent, that probably would be the one you'd go for because it's $1,000 and it's supposedly better than 1390. Mm. Uh, that's at December 8th, so it's a bit more of a wait still. So the issue I have, that the reason I'm hoping pre orders get cancelled is because so much of the software I use is locked to CUDA, which is, you know, NVIDIA's native language that talks to their processor architecture so I, I, I'm sort of stuck um, so even if ATI released a card that benchmarked on games and all sorts of stuff you know 100% faster I'd still be stuck with a pre-order on a 3080 because DaVinci Resolve my editing software is CUDA accelerated Redshift which is a render engine I use is CUDA <laughs> accelerated um, it's the, you know the list goes on for probably one more program that I can't remember but still it's things I use all the time um, and I'm, it sort of locks you in that environment. I, there were some of those programs, Redshift you can't, yeah, I don't think. I think it might do Apple Metal, or they've got beta Apple Metal, and I think uh, DaVinci Resolve can use Metal and OpenCL cross-platform, but the best performance comes from CUDA because it's just direct access to NVIDIA's API. So everything's sort of written for that, and ATI was sort of behind for so long that all these professional software developers have jumped into bed with CUDA and run with it. Plus also weird shit that I use occasionally, like uh, Deepfake. I've been running a bit of that recently. That's 100% <laughs> yeah. CUDA. So that was using... That, in fact, that was the only time I've ever nearly killed my computer from overdrawing from a 1,200-watt power supply. It was running three cards flat out on a Deepfake. So yeah, there's a lot of... It's a bit of a shame that I can't just jump ship <laughs> because it's a hassle sitting around waiting indefinitely for a card. You guys, I mean, like all credit to NVIDIA, though. I mean, it's been a clear and deliberate strategy to build those proprietary tools and to get them out mm. for a case when maybe they aren't king of the hill and they know they've got that lock yeah. in their, their base. Like, and whilst that kind of sucks in some ways like you've, you've got to admire their their business now so like they have spent years making that, yeah. that happen <laughs> and now yeah. now there is now a position where you need that lock in then they've got it you know people will still carry on with their cards which gives them money to make the next set of cards so you know not that they're going bankrupt particularly but yeah. you know, um, Far from they have, it, they've done a good job <clears throat> well you're you tempted i know probably not because of the price tag but if it does exist in the middle you tempted by the thirty ninety? For what I do, I I wouldn't. I I'd be less likely to use that than I would two thirty eighties. Because if I remember rightly, price wise, it's actually you can buy two thirty eighties for a thirty ninety, can't you? And then a hundred hundred pounds left over. Yeah, which is absurd. So with, <laughs> so with so with all of the things I use, so Redshift Render Engine, it the memory pool it loads the entire scene into both. That's kind of how graphics cards want to work. You dump everything into the memory and then they run like crazy off of that. So you load the whole scene into both and then they work together, not through SLI. You don't need NVLink or anything. They just, they just get the CPU assigns them frames or buckets of a frame and they just go off <laughs> and render together. Um, so the more cards, the better. It would only be worth doing a 3090 for some the stuff that I do. And same with DaVinci Resolve as well. It just goes, oh, you've got this many cards. I'll split all the stuff I'm doing between them. When it renders, like one of them will do video and code. The other two will do grading or what have you. Um, so it, it, they intelligently pass information around between the cards without anything like SLI and VLink and, and, and so on. And that speeds everything up. 3090 would have to be double the power in a, in a CUDA task for me to bother using it. There are th I've, the, I've talked to people online who are, you, who are ordering them or have got them or are or, or have considered ordering them and it's all um, these weird niche cases for CUDA like people use it for scientific research and stuff so, so they need these massive memory pools on the one card and um, one guy was saying oh I can put two together, NV link them and then this weird scientific software I use makes it all one big VRAM pool 
And then they both worked together off a big pool using the full speed of NVLink bandwidth. So that was crazy. But yeah, I, th- I think it's a real edge case stuff. I- I'm not really quite sure why people are buying it unless they're professional benchmarkers, which I think do exist now, don't they, strangely enough? <laughs> and um, yeah. research and VP, virtual production people. Virtual production as well, lots and lots of memory. But again, you can't, I don't think you can gen lock or time sync these cards. So yeah, it's a weird, I think it's a fucking weird product, Swore. <laughs> it's a weird yeah. product. And there is there is some interesting features being revealed for the the six thousand uh, series as well with with AMD because they have this Infinity Cache thing, which I guess is mm. a play on that Infinity Fabric thing. They supposedly got then this massive throughput that's you know effective if you pair it with um, the five thousand mm. series and the five hundred series uh, motherboard. So you could actually get yourself in quite a quite a position where you could put in, I have no idea if you could even do this, but I suspect you probably can. You have a 38 for your CUDA mm. task, really, then you could have a 6,900 XT <laughs> next to it in there to, to offload any tasks that were, were you know, good for, for that side. That's an interesting thought. It's a, that's quite a smart move on their part, though, isn't it? Putting a like yeah. a specific bit like it's like a, a game level up thing isn't it like if you get this uh, this upgrade and this group they, they lack together and double the power it's so cunning like if you're Rage using a 5000 yeah exactly it's like you can see them going <laughs> locked on super speed yeah. get there because i am printed my i i think yeah, if if I if I hadn't have got the thirty eighty and you know you had to act fast, <laughs> I, I I was intending to have a look at these six thousand series cards. I didn't have high hopes, but now obviously I'm thinking that actually maybe it actually is good. But um, reserve judgment, obviously, till we get proper reviews, which I guess won't be out now for yeah, you know, a couple some of times. On the subject of waiting indefinitely for things, one of the things we're always messaging back and forth about when we're talking about kit, kit upgrades before. I got a laptop. We were doing this one for ages. And before I got a new PC, the joke was you were always going to be waiting for the next processor because you, you just never buy a computer. You just go, oh, well, that's going to be out in six months. So I may as well wait for that. And then you die without having ever having used a single computer and you're just, you're really good at etching or something. Um, yeah, but I'm doing a 486 right now to display this. It's really powering yeah, through. This, when I was yeah, this, it's just being streamed. You've, you have to like eight switches and then lock in the bits at the end. And that's per word, you know, program with switches. Mary had a little lamb. Um, <laughs> so it took me ages and ages to buy a laptop. And then I, I was buying one for production purposes and also occasionally gaming. And um, so the thing I was... I mean, an iron about was waiting for 11th gen Intel. I mean, in the end, I didn't bother because I saw all of this kind of silicon backlog where people just can't make enough uh, GPUs. And I figured, well, this could well be affecting processors too. Who knows? So I'll just go for something now while it's on offer. So it was like a 14% off Alienware thing. I went for an Alienware that has the unlimited wattage GPU, unlimited wattage CPU. And so far, it has once... There's the, the software that controls the fans have just decided not to spin up a fan and the whole thing shut down and I had to put it in the fridge. <laughs> so it, it, I'm wondering if the 11th gen might have been a smart thing to wait for so that my GPU didn't go to 104 degrees and cook itself to death and possibly damage itself. <laughs> I've still got to find out whether it's damaged. What you've got there is, because you've got a, um, a 10th gen, but I don't think you have, I can't remember because it's so many really lake names, whatever it is, the... Mm. Like ice, like whatever the one that is the the ten. They actually do have a ten nanometer part already in the tenth mm. gen. It's only on laptops, but I think you've got a, as you said, a full wattage, mm. fourteen nanometer, actually you know, a semi desktop. Oh, yeah. Obviously, you wanted that, and that would have you know caused a lot of, of heat issues. But it's worth checking that out because I'm just guessing on that one. But yeah. I guess the other, other thing you could have done, which I think you, you couldn't because there don't exist yet many, but there is the Zen 2 confusingly named 4000 yes. series um, AMD chips that are pretty powerful as well. But as I understand it, they don't, as you told me, that there aren't any on the market with full GPUs. Yeah, that's the issue. So that this this is... um. This is a tenth gen, so I picked their top spec one because they did. You know, you know, it's um, fourteen percent off. It's obviously you get more money off if you spend more. So it was the top spec you could get, which was like a twenty eighty twenty eighty super, um, and uh, a tenth gen i nine, 
Yeah, I think it, I think it is some kind of full wattage thing. So I, I, I checked the specs versus Razer. So Razer was the other option I had. They weren't having a sale, so it would cost me a bit more. It's a much prettier thing. It's it's um, you know the, al- the aluminium sort of unibody star thing, all black, or that has that terrible tribal symbol on the back. But it, it's it's specs way lower because there's a quite a a, there's a much lower wattage limit on the CPU and the and the GPU, but yeah, like I said, it absolutely cooks this thing. Are you, are you, you're, on your, you're not on your laptop right now. You're on your main computer, right? I'm on my tower now. Yes. Yeah, so talking of Ryzen's, this is a 3900X, and um, I did look at because it's so good for multi-core stuff and the specs so well in all sorts of tests, and and it's really good for Unreal shader compiling and stuff that uses multi-core heavily. Um, I did check for Zen-based laptops, but one. They're fucking out of stock everywhere, <laughs> even if you did want one most of the time. And two, they, they have a maximum of like a 10... I could find a 1060 Ti, whatever on God's earth that is. Like why do they do a TA version of a 1060? But I couldn't find anything close to a 2080 super full wattage. That's just not around. Yeah, so they need to fix that, really, like get, get them with good GPUs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is a... I think I think the problem is that a, Intel have completely dominated the the high end laptop space for the, whole, the last decade, maybe because um, the AMD chips are just too hot. Like no one yeah. put them in. It. So now, like none of the system makers u- use them. So it's like a real challenge to try and get them in. But now they're realizing they're good. They're starting to trickle out. But you just don't have that same response of release a chip and then the whole you know, set come out a whole year legacy of um systems so maybe uh maybe soon so yeah the 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 processor in it is the 10980 hk 8 core 16 thread one which is pretty extreme to have in a laptop body and it's very very thin like i have an old alien where it's like six years old that I, I i was upgrading from it was always used for like mobile editing on the go sort of thing and it become too slow to really use for that but it weighed an absolute ton and was about two inches thick and um this one it's so much thinner and lighter it's also bigger at 17 inches but um, i'm guessing that that's the reason the fans are one way louder because it's trying to push all that air through those tiny slots and also yeah. the reason it's so bloody hot i mean this this 10th generation i series is known for running absolutely cooking isn't it it really does boil well, i just i just looked it up and it, it is 14 <laughs> nanometer as well so that would be why so it's not one of the i think there's only the lower power ones they have running on 10 mm. nanometer the the ancient technology basically i mean like i think when did they start doing that i think it was the sixth gen so yeah that's only two years that was 2016 that's been going on since Hmm. which is just nuts really yeah that is the intel thing at the moment isn't it the sort of how long are you going to hold on to 14 nanometer plus 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 and keep adding pluses to it and uh (laughs) before you get a, a processor with a new architecture. Is there something lined up that's supposed to have those? Oh, you were telling me about something that's like a souped up, it's like slapping a supercharger on. <laughs> There's some coprocessor. They're going on to coprocessors or something like that. Yeah, but to try and like deter you from buying a 5000 series Ryzen, these uh, the release of press releases that are so <laughs> unbelievably ineffective <laughs> that they're going to reduce the core count so that's like great that sounds like a perfect idea Cheers, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. and we're going to add like all these kind of special you know AI cores and you know, weird fucking really super like arm type chips onto onto the whole mm. thing so you get these specialized workloads working super fast but it's like just just make the actual processor better and then, <laughs> then we can talk i don't need to know that this weird one-off usage of hvenc encoding i can do it really mm. quick when all i do is game you know i don't know oh, H-Vink H-Vink it. well now you've got my attention like that's quite good maybe you want to get one I mean, again, that's another CUDA accelerated thing. So in the apps I use, there's NVENC, which is NVIDIA's encoder. So I use that all the time. I mean, I get something like, you know, if I'm doing a 1080 edit, which is still quite common, I'll get sort of 300 and something frames a second on export with the grading layers and all that sort of stuff. It's it's bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. But yeah, that, that whole coprocessor thing does seem like, I mean, that's kind of an old school notion, the notion of coprocessors isn't like things around it that do other calculations. And it does seem like a bit of a, 
a desperate move. Like we we just can't get these smaller nanometer processors working in bulk in earnest. We're just going to slap. It's like the whole engine thing, you know, getting a small engine car in your hometown, slapping on a turbo and racing around the car park. <laughs> like you're pushing it to the limit with that technology. It seems like they're they'll need to make some kind of step up at some point if they can get this fabrication working of a smaller die size. Well, that's, that's the whole problem, isn't it? That, that whole business model is built around being in, vertically integrated, being being the fab producers and being the designers. Um, and it's just just blown up in their face. So someone at some point is going to have to just come in and write off all the, all the investment that they've done in, in, in fabrication if they can't yeah. do it soon. It's going to have need like the whole board replacing or something, and you know that they're, they're actually admitting actually we're going to have to do it with TSMC or someone. But yeah. that's going to be such a climb down, and such a big. Yeah. It's, going to, it's going to rip at the core of Intel. You know, it's yeah. like when Sega said they won't make harder anymore. You know, they never were the same. You, know, you can't just can't just take that whole department away. It's most of the. You know, it's half their business. You know, it's yeah. a big deal. Yeah, that's a good parallel, actually, the Sega thing, isn't it? Like that, and it was, but it was actually a, a sort of not just a massive change in the business and the, the sort of uh, fabric of the company, what the company was, but what it was seen as by consumers. It, it became smaller instead of being that sort of behemoth that was always going to dominate consoles. It became, oh, uh, well, you've been losing this since the Saturn onwards, and that's that really. <laughs>